せ切ろうよ切ってやれぬか It's been a trend in games to pursue aggression. Recent titles have been getting tighter, faster, more challenging. From Software is no exception. From Dark Souls to Bloodborne to Dark Souls 3, and with Sekiro, I think they've mastered and perfected their push towards aggression. You have to learn the game, hone your skills, and most of all, never hesitate. Hesitation is defeat. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Yeah, just twice, takes place in a markedly Buddhist interpretation of Sengoku era Japan. The unification under probably Nobunaga is going well, but the Ashina aren't happy with it and stage a revolt. They've also kidnapped the person you were supposed to be protecting, Kuro, the divine heir of the dragon's heritage, whose blood can make man immortal. However, Kuro has grown to resent his heritage, as the temptation of eternal life corrupts all men. So you're tasked with searching both this world and the next for the pieces needed to sever this eternal bond. Or you can just give up and fucking kill everybody. <laughs> the PC version of this game is fine, I guess, but should be better considering this is a multi platform game from 2019. Like, the refresh rate is locked to 60 hertz, which is kind of a pet peeve for me. There's a fix for it on Nexus mods, but it's a lot of steps and I don't feel like it. But hey, at least this game fucking has a PC port, right? This is a late 8th gen game, so it looks damn good on a technical level. The anti aliasing is just kind of bad, but that's just every 8th gen game. Let's call it industry standard. We're at the point of technology where devs can really show whatever they want, so the important part here is the art. From's animators are at the top of their field and making fast, fluid animations that are easily readable in the heat of battle. Due to all the technical shit in the frame data, these games can only be as good as their animations. If the animations are bad, you end up with Dark Souls 2. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> <laughs> And the art is a fucking treat. Rather than being vaguely European medieval like Dark Souls, Sekiro takes place in Sengoku, Japan, with a mythological twist. The game is paced in a way that gradually brings all these supernatural elements in. So you start out with a fairly grounded historical drama, then by the end of the game, you're flying through the fucking air shooting lightning at a dragon so you can steal his goddamn tears. On the sound side, the gameplay audio here is incredible. That cling, bang, cling from an efficient sword fight never gets old. It's so important to gameplay that blind people can actually beat this game with a little help, and deaf people have a hard time with it. I mean, how is a deaf person supposed to know about the Wu guy? This is one of those Japanese games that has an English dub, but they ask you nicely to just leave it in Japanese. And you really should. My argument for subs over dubs is too long for this video, but trust me, it's a Japanese game about feudal Japan, just leave it in Japanese. And for the record, if you catch me mispronouncing something, I know. English and Japanese require different oral postures, which are uncomfortable to switch between during narration, so you're gonna hear me flip flop between Sekiro and Sekiro. An honorable mention goes out to English Gyobu, who gave his fucking vocal cords for this line. My name is Gyobu Masataka Oniwa! Also, Spanish Gyobu for that. Me amo! And you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, French Gyobu is like aggressively French. Mon nom est Gyobu Masataka Oniwa! Sur mon honneur, tu ne franchiras pas la porte! Donc lui, le démon While the Soulsborne games made the deliberate choice to not include ambient music for areas, Sekiro has actual area music. Each area has one track for ambient exploration, one for tension, and one for combat. Yeah, music implementation hasn't gone very far in the past 20 years, has it? There's even a little sting when the tension track starts. Kitamoto Yuka did all of the music. She's been with From Software since Dark Souls 2, but if you were to recognize any track from her, it'd be Soul of Cinder. You know, oh! Unfortunately, out of all the games she's done, her tracks have been my least favorite. I don't know anything about music theory, so I can't explain it, but I prefer tracks that have a strong, like, memorable melody, but Kitamura's tracks tend to focus on the overall sound instead. And I mean, that overall sound is incredible, but, like, here, here, I got it, I got it. We all know Soul of Cinder, right? You got, oh, and then you got the, but do you remember the rest of it? I don't, but all of Suzuki Nobuyoshi's tracks have a permanent spot in my fucking brain. My issue is a personal preference thing, but it applies to pretty much the entire soundtrack. There are a few strong melodies, though.
I think the biggest strength of the soundtrack is its use of traditional Japanese instruments alongside modern string and brass ones. It creates such a beautiful fucking sound. Overall, even though Kitamura was my least favorite of the main Soulsborne composers, she is absolutely a master of her craft, and I'm glad she's working on Elden Ring. Oh, Elden Ring! Gameplay-wise, it's kind of hard to talk about Sekiro without talking about FromSoft's previous games. I'm gonna bring them up in this video, but you won't be lost if you haven't played any of them. Sekiro has brought so much new shit to the table that it'd be easier to answer what hasn't changed. The general format is still the same. You explore a bunch of interconnected areas with challenging enemy encounters, looking for items, and killing bosses. Pretty much everything else is new. For starters, you now have a grappling hook and a real jump button. The controls for it are okay. Like, sometimes you'll try to grab a ledge and just won't. And sometimes the grapple hook targeting just decides it doesn't like you. They've also added a basic stealth system. If you've played a video game in the past 10 years, you already know how it works. Crouch to go ghost mode, AI detection builds slowly and shifts between passive search and combat states, you can throw shit to distract people, and you can sneak attack people to death. Its implementation is nothing new, but stealth is an addition that is very welcome. You don't have a great tool set for managing crowds, so stealth gives you the opportunity to poke around, pick your targets, and pick off your targets. For the first time in any FromSoft game, you're actually mobile enough to pick your fights. Too many guys? Just leave. That sounds obvious, but it changes the whole flow of the gameplay. As you murder everyone and steal their shit, you pick up both money and experience. Oh my gosh, how? How are you doing? Why? Uh, my money, my hard-earned money, I, I earned that. When you level up, your experience is banked, regardless if you've spent the skill point yet. When you die, you lose a percentage of your money and your unbanked experience. To get it back, you have to go fuck yourself, I guess. That shit's gone forever. Instead, you have a 30% chance to lose nothing. I honestly have no idea why they changed the death system like that. Speaking of death, you could probably guess from the title that you don't just die once. You're a shadow, so you die twice? <clears throat> I don't know man, I think Sekiro is a cool enough title on its own, but I'm sure some brand manager somewhere is proud of themselves. When you die, you can use a resurrection node to come back. If you die twice in a row, you're dead for real. Back to the bonfire with you. You can unlock more nodes later, but those are powered by the death of your enemies. Did you think immortal life was free? Nah man, that shit's a curse. That's why you're trying to get rid of it. Every time you die for real, you consume the life of those around you. This manifests as dragon rot. After enough deaths, NPCs in the world will get sick. Each sick guy lowers that 30% chance to lose nothing on death. I genuinely don't remember if people can die from Dragon Run, but I don't like the system regardless. This joke isn't mine, but these games are for the kind of people who see a brick wall and think the fastest way through is with their skull, so I don't see why it's punishing me for bashing my head into it too many times. Bloodborne had a similar thing with the blood vials, since you could run out of healing items if you died to the same boss over and over, so I feel like it's intentional? My guess is that it's a reminder that you don't have to keep ramming your head into the wall. You know, you could go try something else for now. If that's its purpose, I'd say it was successful, but it still doesn't sit with me right to punish the player for dying a lot, when the company's brand is partially based on how often you die. Sekiro's combat is completely different from what we were used to in the Soulsborne games. Gone are the days of high frame dodging and instantly dying if you whiff a parry. To play Sekiro, you must master the blade. And who better to learn from than Miyamoto Musashi, master swordsman and philosopher of the Edo period. We'll be focusing on Gorin no Shō, Miyamoto's text on swordsmanship tactics and philosophy. The book is broken into five parts corresponding with the four elements. We're going to master the blade, book by book, and I'll talk about some notable bosses along the way. Since I'm talking about the cool bosses, you can expect spoilers ahead. I really recommend you play this game, but a lot of my points are based around specific details, so I can't help you avoid spoilers. You good? Alright. Earth represents the basic foundation of knowledge, which everything else is built upon. It may be simple, but its importance is paramount. After all, without both feet firmly planted on the ground, what can you truly hope to achieve? As with most games, you hit man, the red bar goes down, man dies. In Sekiro, they have this orange bar that goes up. You have one too, that's your posture meter. If yours fills up, you fall over. But if an enemy's fills up, they get opened up for a death blow, killing them instantly. That doesn't mean health is irrelevant though. If someone has low health, whether it's you or an enemy, they'll take more posture damage with worse posture recovery. And attacking isn't the only way to fill their meter. You can also deflect. <laughs> If you press block just before an attack hits you, you'll deflect it and deal posture damage to your enemy. You can also never be posture broken from an attack you deflect. While previous games have been kind of finicky about what you can and can't parry, you can deflect 
pretty much everything in Sekiro. What are you doing? That attack won't work on him! Get out of the way! No, no. I must have missed. Yes, I missed. In fact, if there's ever an attack you can't deflect, the game will let you know. The first mandatory boss is the Chained Ogre, and he's the perilous attack tutorial. The only real danger he poses are his insta-kill grab attacks, so you just kinda smack him, dodge, keep smacking, and repeat until death. Except he has a second health bar. Yeah, pretty much every boss has multiple health bars, which work well to mark out phases. Other games have boss phases based on health percentages with the occasional second health bar. There's none of that tomfoolery here. If you stab him once, it'll probably just piss him off. If you stab him until the red goes away, they're not getting back up. The midterm exam for the Earth unit is, um... What's his fucking name again? It's on the tip of my tongue. My name is Kyobu Masataka Oniwa! Oh yeah! Yobu is your midterm. He asks, are you figuring out how to play? Do you know what Kiken no Kogeki means? There are three kinds of perilous attacks. We just learned grabs with Ogre, but there are also sweeps, which you have to jump over, and thrusts, which can be deflected but not blocked. And if you misread it as a swipe and jump into it, good fucking night. Sweeps are surprisingly forgiving with their hitboxes, so as long as you press jump you're usually safe, but thrusts, man, thrusts are rough. Especially when you're still learning how to deflect. We'll have a fix for that soon. At the end of the first quarter of the game stands Genichiro, the final exam for your understanding of Earth. You just met him at the end of the tutorial, but if you don't know how to play the game yet, you get your cheeks clapped and your arm cut off. You can actually beat him in the tutorial, but he just cheap shot you in the cutscene. It's that classic From Software intro. Welcome to the game. Fuck you. But that was before you learned how to play. Now you've tracked him down, and it's time to put your skills to the test. With other bosses, you could just kind of dart around and get some hits in like you were playing a Souls game, but Genichiro is where this game's deflection-based combat really clicks. When you fight Genichiro, you start to enter Sekiro's version of the Fun Zone, and he's got a few attacks to throw you off if you were still playing this like a Souls game. My absolute favorite is the one where he jumps into the air and shoots three arrows. Sorry, four arrows. If you try to dodge or run from the first three, the fourth is perfectly timed to catch you right in the ass. It's not just a dick move though, because you can also just cut the arrows out of the air like a fucking baller. Gyobu made sure you knew which way the ground was, and Genichiro made sure your feet were firmly planted on it. You fight him at the beginning, middle, and end of the game, and he serves as a constant reference point for your growing skill. He is an absolute joy to fight, and this is only the beginning. We've still got more books to cover. To recap, you deal with enemies by both attacking and deflecting, and you should really try to deflect everything and attack when you can. The game will tell you when it wants you to do something else. Water represents fluidity and clarity of mind. Look at a flowing river. The water does not need to expend energy to find its path, it simply flows. It's clear blue in color, but not so transparent as to betray what's inside. In practical terms, this means you need to remain calm, adapt to the situation at hand, and find the smoothest rhythm. Yeah, sure, just stay calm. Yeah, great advice, dumbass. I mean it, though. There's no immediate penalty for spamming block, and enemies are scary. I mean, just look at this fucking guy. It's easy to spam block as kind of a flinch reflex. Don't do that. For one, spamming block narrows the deflect timing and it stops your posture from recovering. You're better off not pressing it at all so your posture recovers. You can either run around panicking and spamming block, or stand completely still and defend at the perfect moment like a chad. While the other games had numerical stats, Sekiro has a perk tree system for its upgrades. There's a few numerical upgrades, but most of them are unlockable techniques and attacks. You can find skill books in the world to learn from different schools, whether it's the underhanded tactics of the shinobi, the secret arts of your new prosthetic hand, the swordsmanship of the ashina, or the barehanded martial arts of the senpo buddhist monks. The absolute fucking best skill you can get is the makiri counter. I fucking love the makiri counter. So goddamn much. Remember how I mentioned that thrust attacks are kind of a problem? Yeah, that was a lie. Eat fucking shit. It would be true if the Makiri counter wasn't the first skill you unlock. What does it do? Well, when you see a thrust attack coming, dodge directly into it to step up onto their blade and force it to the ground. 
They even take extra posture damage from the emotional trauma of getting so thoroughly destroyed. The Makiri counter has a special place in my heart for a number of reasons. For one, you take a perilous attack and completely turn the tables on it. Two, you execute the counter by having the balls to charge straight into danger. And three, the animations and sound are so fucking satisfying. You can see that fearsome veneer crumble away and betray that look of oh shit as they have to wrest their blade out from under you. Bosses will usually block your attacks unless you find an opening, so most of your damage is going to be posture damage. However, However, posture recovers on its own. If they're not attacking or getting attacked, that bar is going to go right back down to zero. So if you want to make progress, you've got to get in the meat. They've been trying to encourage being in the meat for a while, with Bloodborne's Quick Steps and Rally and Dark Souls 3's hyper-aggressive AI for example, but Sekiro has made it actually fun, and it's the first time I've seen a game actually create a satisfying back-to-back -back rhythm that you'd expect from a sword fight. Video game bosses pretty much always follow the same rhythm. You identify the attack they're using, mitigate that attack, try to get some damage in, and repeat until someone dies you only make progress on the boss during that last step. But in Sekiro, you can deal posture damage by both attacking and deflecting. So, as long as you're right in the meat, keeping pressure on the boss, you're making progress, no matter how many stupid attacks they decide to chain together. Except this game doesn't really have stupid attacks, since it's designed for the deflection system, not the iframe dodge system. While the iframe system is fun, I feel like it kind of peaked in Bloodborne. Because attacks have to be designed around dodging them, they're limited to big, sweeping, heavy-hitting attacks to punish bad dodging and make good ones feel rewarding. If they do anything fast or hard-hitting, then you just kind of back up, wait for them to tucker themselves out, and walk back in. Or just poise through it like a chad. God, I love Havels. This limit on attack designs means you can play like 80 to 90% of the game just kind of rolling behind your enemy without really learning the ins and outs of their movesets. It might sound tedious on paper to require you to learn the boss's moveset, but I think Bloodborne proved that was the fun part. Do I need to play the clip again? No, I don't. Guarding a MacGuffin you need is the Corrupted Monk. She's got a lot of health and a giant Naginata, which makes her pretty intimidating. But don't be scared, just stay calm, remember your training. Don't flinch and hit block every time she moves. Follow the blade, and only block when it's coming at you. This is a great boss to show that Sekiro is very fair about the enemy movesets and the momentum of their weapons. They do actually have to swing to attack, and their weapons take time to change directions. They still try to change things up to throw you off, but it feels fair. Notably, there's this attack where she swipes from one side, then brings her weapon around to hit from the same side. She's one of my favorite fights, and it's pretty much down to the Nagadada. Its weight makes it satisfying to read and deflect, and it's a pole arm, so you've got Makiris for days. To wrap up the Book of Water, Sekiro's deflection-based combat creates a natural rhythm to fights, where you can make progress by both attacking and defending. Also, the Makiri counter is fucking sick. While earth and water covered the sword, fire is the book of fighting. Fire consumes that which is weak to fire and doesn't bother with anything else. Thus, you must act according to their weakness and exploit it without hesitation. We've been learning from a master samurai, but you're no samurai. You're a dirty little shinobi. There's a fine line between honor and victory, and you have the tools to seize that victory no matter how dishonorable it might be. Give it! Uh, pocket sand! Uh, after getting disarmed at the beginning, you get a prosthetic one made of wood. It came with a grappling hook, but there are all kinds of toys for you to jam in there. These tools give you an answer for specific scenarios. Flying enemies? Shuriken. Animals? Firecrackers. Red eyes? Fire. Armor? Spear. Shields? Axe. Socket deflecting? Shield. Women? Poison. Learning all these is pretty easy since the game will either straight up tell you, or it'll be signposted for you. The prosthetic tools are useful, but they're limited to spirit emblems, which you have to buy and you can only carry like a handful. It's comparable to the bullets in Bloodborne. They're not really worth using on bosses, since you'll lose emblems with every failed attempt, and they kinda do jack shit. I only really use the shuriken since its follow-up attack was good for closing distance. Still, if it gives you an advantage, you should take it. Here's an example. You see this lady? Yeah, me neither. She exists to punt lightning at you, so you have to take the long way around the level to fight her. She's supposed to be a mini-boss, but I bought a piece of paper from a bean man. 
She showed weakness and I didn't hesitate to exploit it. Hesitation is defeat. This is Lady Butterfly. She's, um, I wasn't paying attention. She's a boss. And she is the final lesson of the Book of Fire. As you get better at the game and practice what you've learned so far, you'll start to learn a technique that Miyamoto refers to as Ken no Sen. I just call it clang clanging. Rather than simply falling into the rhythm that the enemy creates for you, you dictate the flow of battle by being aggressive as possible. You keep them from attacking by forcing them to defend. They can still counterattack during this, but it's telegraphed by a louder deflect sound. If you hear that, they're about to counterattack. If you deflect that counterattack, you have an opening to keep attacking until you hear the noise again. This isn't foolproof, however, as enemies have spacing attacks and anyone taller than your manlet ass is gonna have poise for days. Of course, how could we talk about fire without talking about the- No! Get out of here! Shoo! We're having fun! Go away! Bad monkey! Fuck off. Okay, he's gone. Moving on, a shinobi should know the difference between honor and victory, and you need to be aware of anything that can seize that victory. While the rest of Gorin no Sho was written to be generally applicable or extrapolated in a way that fits a stupid idea for a script about a video game, The Book of Wind was largely focused on Miyamoto's discussion and criticism of his contemporaries. And no, I have no idea what that has to do with Wind. His general criticisms are that other sword schools are overly specialized or impractical for real combat. Like, sure, you can train all day with extra long swords to outrange any opponent, but are you really that confident that you'll never let anyone get close to you? There are some sick burns in here, but we can't use any of this directly. We'll have to apply the same logic to the world of Sekiro studying our opponents firsthand and identifying their weaknesses. Since Sekiro pulls so much from Japanese history, there are already a lot of parallels between the sword schools Miyamoto is criticizing and the enemies in the game. The Ashina Elite is a mini-boss who has honed and trained one skill, the Ashina Cross. Its speed is only matched by its lethality. However, what if you can do it too? What's his plan for when it doesn't kill you? Sure, he's an intimidating enemy, but all his years of training were for nothing if the only other attack he could muster was the People's Elbow. The Ashina Cross isn't the only move you can share with your enemies. You can also learn the Ashina and Senpo techniques, which makes countering them way easier. Notably, Genichiro has this rapid sword slice attack that's usually too intimidating to try and deflect. He learned it from Tomoe of the Fountainhead Palace, and you can learn it too. Once you get the timing down, it stops being, oh shit, he's doing the attack, and it turns into, oh hey, I can do that too. It never becomes a mirror match, but it's always cool to see a familiar move. Speaking of mirror matches, Owl flips this entire chapter on its head. He's your adopted father. He taught you everything you know, so he's got all the same tricks. Oh fuck, I forgot about that. Owl is an absolute bastard, but that's a good thing in your family. As you saw, he can Makiri counter, which is always hilarious to die to. He can death blow you if your posture broken. He can do the little Mario jump thing, throw shurikens, Lloyd's talismans, poison, pocket sand, fireworks, all the dishonorable little things you thought were unique to you. He even fakes a fucking heart attack. Normally when a boss cheap shots you, you're just kind of like, ugh. But with Owl, it's more like, all right, yeah, I can respect that. You are a fucking shithead. Oh my god. Okay, yeah, I genuinely do love this game, but you wouldn't get that impression from listening to me play it. For those untrained in the way of the sword, the Guardian Ape is a tough fight. However, his technique falls apart under close scrutiny. That is to say, he has no technique. He relies on his savage, high damage attacks and has little regard for his own defense. As long as you keep a clear head and remember the four elements of swordsmanship, you can clear this ape's head from its shoulders. After all, technique and tradition is what separates man from beast. Wait, I said, I said four elements. Isn't, isn't it five rings? Oh no. Void is that which cannot be known and that which cannot be seen. Void is, of course, nothing. No man can claim to know nothing. Okay, I genuinely do not fully understand what's going on in this book. I thought seeing the original Japanese would help clear things up, but apparently they hadn't invented fucking punctuation yet. I asked some Japanese people, but the only response I got was a mild compliment. I, I had to reach out to my philosophy major buddy, and I basically got a shrug out of him, but the conversation was still pretty helpful. Out of gratitude, I asked if he wanted to plug anything, and he runs a Critical Role highlights channel, so be sure to check that out if you're into that kind of thing. If I got something wrong before, it was probably a deliberate extrapolation of the text to help fit the video together. But here, 
However, my interpretation could just be wrong. I see Void as the importance of taking the unknown and the unseen into account when fighting. Kind of like being ready for anything, but a bit more epistemological. Something you don't know of is not Void, it's ignorance. Something you don't understand is also not void, it is bewilderment. You can correct these by learning, but you can never learn void, for it is nothing. To truly know nothing, you must understand enough to know where there is nothing. Through your understanding of what exists, you can start to see the borders of what doesn't exist. Am I making sense? Probably not. <laughs> Here's an example. The square root of a negative number does not exist. It is nothing. It is void. We know enough about math to know where there is something and where there is nothing. Similarly, you can learn so much about the game that you know where there is nothing. If you learn a boss's full moveset, you know what they can't do. As such, this chapter will cover the little things that surprise you on your path to truly understand Void. As you get familiar with a boss's moveset and rhythms, you'll notice that there were some things that you didn't actually know about. I call this, what the fuck are you doing? I have a hundred hours in this game and I've never seen that attack in my entire life, what the fuck? And of course, the you win message on killing a boss has always been sacred, until now. Hey, we already did this joke. God damn it. The Book of Void is also the perfect place to be facetious about random annoying inconsistencies with the game. Sometimes it's with the AI, but it's so ridiculously infrequent that I've only seen a few examples in my 120 hour playtime. Where are you going? They're not usually that funny, they're usually just infuriating. Like, I deflect a thousand crosses from Ishin, and then he just decides to do something else. No, you fucker, you fucking old bastard. The rest of the time it's the camera. That shouldn't be a surprise since third person cameras are always tricky, but knowing that doesn't make me feel any better. There's also a limit to how quickly characters can turn, which applies to you too. Notice how we're both fucking missing each other here. And then I die, which was my bad, and then the camera just completely refused to cooperate and I get shot in the back. God. Facetious bit aside, it's important to not fall into the rhythm created in your head through practice, but into the rhythm that's naturally created in the present. When you appreciate the power of nature, knowing rhythm of any situation, you will be able to hit the enemy naturally and strike naturally. All this is the way of the void. We've reached the end of the five rings. Did, did you catch all that? Sorry if you didn't. The proper way to learn is through practice after all. That's why we've got to take the training wheels off. After your first playthrough, you can give Kuro his charm back at the start of the game. The charm is like your training wheels. Taking it off means you scrape your knee a lot, but it is way more fun. This whole time, you've been able to block if you miss a deflect. Yeah, that shit's not gonna cut it anymore. Without the charm, your margin for error is drastically reduced. So now you actually have to learn fights instead of just spamming block and panicking. And because I like dying, I also turn on the demon bell as soon as I can, which just makes the game harder. Sekiro's core swordplay is the most fun I've had with the FromSoft formula since Bloodborne. I've taken you through the basic learning curve, but the fun doesn't stop there. Unlike the other Soulsborne games, Sekiro continues to respect and challenge you no matter how good you get. That was a meme in Dark Souls, you know, get good because it was always an option, but it's not what the developers expect from you. In Dark Souls, it'll sometimes feel like you hit a brick wall, where maybe you need different gear, a higher level, or a different build, or some kind of specific strategy. Or maybe you just need to get good. No, that was a two-handed attack that I could dodge. I could parry. I gotta get in the meat. Oh my god. I, I, I did it! Ah! He's so... Okay, okay, okay. Okay, don't get greedy. Plin, plum. I need another parry. Even though he's on really low health. I... Yes! That was... That took so many attempts, you have no idea. Oh my fucking god. Sekiro is so fair in its design and transparent about what it expects from you that I'd never hit that wall. Sure, there are bosses that took me hours to get past, but I was never like, okay, how the fuck are you supposed to beat this guy? I was more like, damn, I gotta watch out for that. Oh yeah, I fucking like getting killed like that. Fuck. Uh, okay, I wasn't actually that calm. But I knew what I had to do, and Sekiro rewarded me for believing in myself. This game feels like it respects you way more than their previous games. There isn't really anything that's just there to be a middle finger to the player. Like, look at this clip. They fucking knew your character would block your view of that hole. They put that hole there specifically to fuck with you. Sure, Sekiro can still be frustrating, but you really have no one to blame but yourself. I... 
keep doing it. I blame the fucking, I blame something that isn't me. You may have mastered the five rings, but you can't truly call yourself a master while Ishin draws breath. He is a master class in final boss design, a true test in everything you've learned. He's dead. Um. In his place stands our old friend Genichiro, who at this point in our skill development is little more than an annoyance. It's a great bookend to see how much you've grown. Sword Saint Ishin is fucking awesome. His first phase, as his name implies, is a master swordsman. He wrote two of the skill books you've been learning from, disarmed the master of the prosthetic arts, and the master shinobi faked his own death and hid like a bitch to avoid fighting this guy in his prime, which you're doing right now. Oh yeah, and those skills he taught you? He's way better at them. After you get through that, he whips out a giant spear and a fucking gun. Ishin's fight encapsulates each of Miyamoto Musashi's five rings. Earth, water, fire, wind, and void. He is so goddamn fun that I actually put the time and practice in to no-hit the entire fight. In a lot of Soulsborns and Souls likes, I end a lot of fights thinking something like, that was annoying, I'm glad that's over. But Sekiro has consistently made me finish bosses thinking, oh, that was fucking sick. However, if I'm being completely honest, Ishin isn't the hardest boss. Deep in the shaded woods, I mean hidden forest, you can hear his siren song, mocking you, luring you in. I warn you, this boss is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> yeah, I'm fucking with you. He's just this game's version of Pinwheel. Except you could feasibly die to Pinwheel, but not Miss Noble. You'd have to, like, put the controller down and walk away. Miss Noble is funny and you gotta have at least one Pinwheel per game, but there are some bosses that I think are just bad. Sekiro is laser focused on creating good one-on-one -on -one sword fights like this one, so aspects that would work in a Souls game don't really cut it anymore. The Blazing Bull is a very early boss and I've always found it stupid. You can't really deflect his attacks, so you just have to run around and get some slaps in where you can. It's just not what you sign on for when you play this game. I mean, for fuck's sake, even those masochistic super hard mode mods will nerf the bull. Like, yeah, I gave Ishin the mortal blade because fuck you, but let's tone this bull back a little. There's a mini boss at the very end of the game that's just two regular mini bosses in the same tight space with hurt floors. I call them Ornstein and Smont. Each guy is fun on their own, but holy fuck, it is not fun to manage more than one guy at a time. I ended up using Puppeteer on the gun guy sleeping in the corner, and just trying to DPS Smoant to death so I could 1v1 Ornstein in peace. Orin is placed as if she's an obstacle, but you can actually just run past her. You probably should, since her stats are way higher than you would be at this point in the game. Even when you have endgame stats and equipment, she's still just irritating to fight. She has this flowy, high damage moveset, which is cool, but she keeps going Danny Phantom ghost mode, so it's frustrating to get your hits in. She's also just a a little faster than the camera, which leads to some cheap deaths. You killed the Guardian Ape before you learned how to sever immortality, so he's actually still out there. And still headless. Good riddance. That's fine, I'll end him for real. I like this fight anyway. Except, he summons his fucking girlfriend. You don't have a clean way to manage two bosses at once, so you just kind of have to run around getting hits in on the little one while you can. On top of that, this arena is like a quarter of the size of the Guardian one, so you won't immediately notice, but you're actually fighting three bosses. The headless ape, his girlfriend, and the fucking camera. The Demon of Hatred is easily my least favorite. It has a god tier buildup in context, but the fight itself is just abysmal. I tend to hit the shadow play button when I feel like I've been killed by some bullshit, mostly just so I can have the vindication of it being on record, and I hit it a lot for this guy. He's just a fucking bad Dark Souls 3 boss. You can't really deflect most of his attacks, and there's no way you're breaking his posture, so you just kind of run around and slap him on the ass for three phases. Jesus Christ, it's so long. <laughs> oh. 
and he has multiple attacks that'll just one-shot you. It's more tolerable with the charm and without the Bell Demon, but it's still fundamentally unfun. I actually just turned off the Bell Demon to get footage of him. As I've said before, turning down the difficulty is disrespecting the designers. You're saying that the system, for whatever reason, isn't worth mastering. And again, in this case, that's exactly what I'm fucking saying. Fuck this boss. The purification ending has some bosses that just kind of flat out suck ass. Like this guy with the lone shadow moveset, except he summons Im immortal dogs? Why? why? Why are they immortal? My winning strategy was to stunlock him so badly that he couldn't even get one whistle off. They also added two lone shadows to the Juzo fight. Why the f- who, who the f- who the fuck was like, Eh, you know what that annoying fucking Juzo fight needs? More dudes! Thankfully, the Owl Father fight at the end is superb. He is an absolute bastard and I love him for it. Oh yeah, this is your dad. I haven't even started on the story yet. Jesus Christ, we're fucking 50 minutes into recording this. Ugh. There are four endings, and it follows the theme from Dark Souls, where you have two pretty obvious endings, like Link the Fire or Don't, but you can also do some esoteric bullshit on the side to get another one, like how you can apparently marry Henri in Dark Souls 3. Sekiro is significant in the sense that the routes actually have a few different bosses. Gameplay-wise, I think your first playthrough should be Immortal Severance, then go for Shura in New Game Plus. If you don't know what any of these words mean, just remember, if you do what your dad wants, you get the bad ending. That's the real moral of the story. Don't listen to your dad, you'll become a monster. Amusingly, when I was trying to get footage for the Shura ending, I went through the menu too quickly and picked the wrong option, so I had to play the entire game again just to get footage for two bosses. Meh, okay. And we're back. Sekiro is From's most story-driven game, but that doesn't mean you need the story to enjoy it. I didn't really pay that much close attention to it, but it's okay because it's not very demanding. It's not like Bloodborne where you have to really pay attention and read between the lines, or read a lot of lines in the form of the Pale Blood Hunt, to know what's going on. I know what's going on in Sekiro because they told me what's going on. It shares a lot of similar themes that we're used to in Dark Souls stories, except this is the only game where the situation isn't just completely fucking hopeless. Even in the bad ending, the world is gonna be okay. It may seem like the typical Soulsborne hopelessness with every Everything being fucked at the end, but that's just kind of how Japan was. And they turned out alright. I mean, we're playing this game, right? Sure, most of the endings are more bittersweet than wholly positive, but in every other Soulsborne ending, everything was fucked. Even the tragic fight with an old man trope isn't even that tragic. Like, maybe Genichiro is a little tragic, with his misguided desire to use the dragon's heritage to protect his homeland, and resurrecting his dead grandfather to do what he couldn't. But Ishin doesn't give a shit. He's just like, hell yeah, I'm alive! Let's fucking fight, bro! And when you beat him, he even musters the strength to sit upright so he can die with honor. And then the game glitched and I couldn't death blow him. Holy shit, we made it! There was a lot to talk about for this video, and I hope I was able to get it across cohesively. I wanted to get into how much this game draws from mythology and folklore, but I just did not have that kind of time. If I want you to take one thing away from this video though, it's that Sekiro's posture-based swordplay creates some of the best boss fights I have ever seen. FromSoft has such a firm grip on skill-based action game design that I literally do not care what Elden Ring Oh. Elden Ring is. I just know I'm excited to see whatever they do next. They've carved themselves a niche little space, and it seems like they're just doing whatever the fuck they want now. Which is exactly how I like it. Jesus Christ, that was a goddamn hour. Phew, that was a long video. That fucking... <laughs> uh, that was the longest video I've made, and it sadly didn't come out how I wanted it to. Um, the script uh, got away from me, uh, clearly. I was doing a lot of schoolwork at the time of making it. Um... Yeah, there were things that I wanted to do in the script that just never ended up coming across the way I wanted. And also, I have no fucking idea what I'm doing in terms of sound, um, which is always enjoyable. But um, if you enjoyed the video, and I mean, if you're, you know, you're still here, so you've either left it on or you're enjoying yourself, um, then f please, you know, feel free to like, subscribe, um, you know, sit, let me know what you think of the video, uh, positive or negative. If you don't feel like saying anything, just leave, you know, like a little smiley face or something like that. Um, cause you know, a like is a metric and it's just like, okay, yeah, whatever. But you know, a comment is like, oh, hey, look, that's a human being. 
And if you really like the video, I also have a Patreon where you can join the likes of these two absolute chads with their god-tier patience and support. Uh, thank you both, this video took way too long. Uh, stay tuned next time when we uh, steal some shit. Or something, I don't know, that's what's planned, I haven't started. Uh, yeah, that's about it, see ya.